sit down and get quiet. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank each of you for being here this afternoon. I'm Lydia Chassanall, and uh, I see that uh, one of our senior members of the Senate's Tourism Committee is arriving, so we want to be sure that uh, everyone is able to be here is here. And if you want to sit, we can mix up. I don't mind if Senate and House co-mingle. I think it's a good idea for us to do that. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Curry will be here shortly. And Senator Moran texted me and said he would be here as soon as possible. He's uh, driving up from the coast. I think some of you have had to go through some weather to get here, some bad weather. Let's see. Are we missing any other members who might be in the building that? What about Senator McCann? Uh, no, not McCann, McCann. Senator McMahon. Oh. Excuse me, I should have looked to my immediate left. Uh, Make some noise so we'll know you're here. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we have a distinguished group of speakers lined up for this afternoon and for tomorrow. Um, those of you who are presenters, if you are comfortable removing your mask or lowering your mask when you speak, I think it will help us to be able to hear what you have to say. Um, we have um, a lot of important issues to talk about. Um, <clears throat> some of you are new to the committee. Some of you are new to the legislature. This is my 13th year to be on the Tourism Committee and, and to serve as its chair on the Senate side. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, the uh, effects of this Corona business have, have really hit the tourism industry hard, and I expect that the people who talk to us this afternoon and tomorrow morning will share with us some of the effects that this pandemic has had on our industry. And uh, those of you who have been following along with all of this, you know that this is our fourth largest economic driver for the state of Mississippi, and for those of us who have a fondness for the Delta, as well as the Mississippi Gulf Coast and Northeast Mississippi, in fact, our whole state. It's especially important to the economy in all these regions. And <clears throat> since um, there's some people who asked me to go ahead and begin before they get here, I think we will begin today's um, reports with uh, our Director of Tourism, Mr. Craig Ray, who is uh, here with Visit Mississippi. And Mr. Ray, if you'll come up and uh, tell us what you think we need to hear.
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for having Visit Mississippi here to uh, represent the industry and give you a, a 30,000 feet and below overview of where we are. You have a wonderful group of speakers this afternoon and tomorrow that will identify and specifically talk about their industries from uh, Linda Hornsby, Executive Director of uh, Hotel Lodging Association, Larry Gregory, Mississippi Gaming, Katie Blunt, Archives and History, Rochelle Hicks tomorrow, MTA, uh, uh, Mr. Fontaine with the Restaurant Association, Kelly Davis with Cleveland Tourism, Marla Dorsey, Hattiesburg and the Gulf Coast, and Wildlife, Fishery, and Parks. So you can see over the next two days, this afternoon and tomorrow, you'll be able to identify with the industry as a whole and be able to get a lot of information specifically in those areas. Uh, today, again, I want to just take the opportunity to give an update of this past year, where we are this year, and where we feel that we are going. Uh, FY19, uh, last year was a record year for tourism in the state, a third record year in a row. We had 24.7 million visitors, and those 24.7 million, million visitors represented approximately $6.7 billion in expenditures. Those are the two key numbers that we follow and tourism, and they affect all the other categories. Uh, of those travelers last year, there were 61% of those were from out of state, from Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, Arkansas, North Carolina, were some of the main states. Uh, our international visitors came from, uh, from Canada, the UK, Japan, Germany, uh, Australia, and New Zealand were our top travelers from, from the year. Those um, from the $6.7 billion in industry, every four million in travel expenditures throughout Mississippi and FY19 sustained 54 direct jobs to the state, plus an additional 19 indirect jobs for travel and tourism. Tourism is, uh, as you had mentioned, the fourth largest industry in the state of Mississippi. Um, last year, 91,000 direct jobs and 32,000 indirect jobs in the state of Mississippi. That comes to a total, total annual payroll of $3.23 billion. So that's FYI 19. This year, we were on record, uh, record course again to um, set those uh, record numbers for travel pre-COVID. So, uh, the estimate, uh, our numbers, we always present our final annual report from the previous year during the legislative session, so like February, March of 2021, but these are our, our estimated numbers right now for this past FY20. Now this is, keep in mind, the last four months during COVID. So we were, uh, we, we estimate that our 24.7 million visitors from last year will be approximately 20.5 which is down about 17%, and then an 18% drop in expenditures from 6.7 billion down to 5.5 billion. So when you have fewer visitors, you have fewer expenditures. Uh, we all know that we're playing a level playing field right now with our neighbors in the country and, and travelers as travelers will, is starting to come back slowly. Uh, not only more in-state and more, more in, in town where people are feeling more comfortable to travel just, just a bit and get out. Now one, one interesting number coming into this year, uh, pre-COVID, we were already with four months left in, in the fiscal year, we had set a record for our international travelers. So even before the last four months, we were on record pace for our international community. So we, we know that we're doing so many things in the right way to recruit and to promote Mississippi, and especially as international field is one of the single most possible areas of growth in tourism. And so we were excited to hear those numbers, knowing that we'll be able to resume in that category when international travel begins again, which, which still could be for a while. Um, Another area of, we look at the numbers from this past year, but also we had, uh, we had performed a, uh, we had we'd started uh, about three months ago a research study on our visitor profile, which we had not invested in about eight to 10 years, but as we're going forward to this year and, and next, we wanted to 
review our visitor profile. So this would have been from the year 2019 and what that traveler and that visitor looks like. And of our, and these are travelers from two to three nights stay with, with about 1,800 that, that participated in the poll from a Longwoods International. And we, we found that 31% of our visitors are seeing friends and relatives, 29% are going to the casinos and resorts, and fewer than 10% are either touring, attending special events, or enjoying all of our outdoor activities. 21% of those travelers are from Mississippi. Shows a lot of in-state travel here in the state. 15% are from Louisiana, Florida, Tennessee, Texas, Alabama. So the international studies did not um, flow into this research. Um, and then the top sites of, of interest are the casinos, shopping, beach, and historic sites here in the state. Also, um, we talked about the international travelers. Another part of our marketing program for Visit Mississippi is we manage and run the welcome centers, uh, the 13 welcome centers around the state. We manage the hospitality portion of the welcome centers. Uh, MDOT manages the actual facility and provides maintenance and security. So those numbers, as you can imagine, uh, have, have declined during, during COVID as well as fewer travelers. Our welcome centers were closed for approximately two months for safety reasons. We have reopened them with uh, many COVID guidelines, but those travelers, uh, registered travelers, went from about 1.59 million visitors to down to about 1.2 million. And those are just visitors that we've engaged with, so that actually get out of their vehicle, they come in and they engage with our staff and are requesting information about the state of Mississippi, travel information. It doesn't include, like, y'all can raise your hand how many times you go to a welcome center, maybe just using the facilities and, or, or the vending machines or stretching your legs. So we, we know that there's several million more that uh, visit our welcome centers, but those numbers did uh, decline during COVID, but more and more as we are seeing uh, with the uh, expansion of the millennial travel and more access to information you can pick up on your phone or Wi-Fi from the welcome centers that fewer people are actually using the welcome center, but, but still a strong number to, to know that uh, we have that many people that are engaging with, with our team and looking for more information. Um, the Tourism Development Grant Program. This is a, a program in its eighth year that legislatively is appropriated to our budget where we administer the grant program. It's for small events and festivals uh, throughout the state. Um, this past year, we, we, we just finished the, uh, the program each year. We're, we're appropriated $299,000 to uh, distribute, distribute through a grant program. And, and so we're uh, working on that this year. We're still finalizing the, the scores. We had uh, 88 applicants this year, and, and so they will, uh, which is down from 135 last year. We started the process just a little bit um, later in the game this year because of uh, the budget process that we were uh, with MDA. So um, that program is in its eighth year. I know that many of you and your constituents have encouraged your small town or uh, visitor museums to participate in this program uh, to receive these grant dollars. Um, also, um, currently, right now, the film office is also part of the uh, Visit Mississippi under our management leadership at, at MDA. And during this time frame, uh, when many other states were closed and are still closed for the film industry, once we were able to reopen, we've been busier than one of our biggest years just since, uh, since March. And so a lot of activity around the state, many films are coming to Mississippi One because we're open and our rebate program is very attractive, very, very competitive with other states. So we're picking up a lot of new opportunities, a lot of new, new films that are coming to the state, all over the state from Jackson to the Delta, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Morgan Freeman is actually the first time he's ever filmed in Mississippi as, uh, as uh, a character in a film that's being filmed on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And so we're, we're still seeing a lot of activity pre-COVID, but e even more so now. So that's, that's very exciting. Madam Chairman, I can send you a report on the film, uh, the numbers and where we are there. So uh, 
Before I close, just wanted to look to where we are and where we're planning to be in the spring. Right now, as you can imagine, um, advertising and marketing right now has been a challenge where you're really promoting for the future and keeping in, in, in state of mind of people when they do start to travel to keep Mississippi in mind as a destination. Encourage Mississippians that maybe you don't feel safe going to Florida or Alabama or Louisiana or Texas to look at your state for travel opportunities. And then when we get to the spring, hopefully as COVID starts to diminish and much more open opportunity, we're planning a new spring campaign will be much more robust and really reaching back out to the world and hopefully uh, the international market will pick back up. But we're, we're still in the market. We're still uh, in digital marketing and, and working through this time, but always promoting this, that Mississippi is safe and secure in these areas and encouraging people when they do travel uh, to look at Mississippi, but look at these safe and secure opportunities for travel. So with that, I, I don't know if you have time for any questions or if we uh, move on to the next. Any committee members? Yes, sir. And first. Can you repeat those welcome center numbers uh, again? Um, you talked about how the numbers were down. Can you just repeat those? Yes, I can, actually. Um, this year, uh, FY20, um, 2020, were 1.289 million visitors to our 13 welcome centers. In the previous year, which would be FY19, it was approximately 1.59 million. Thank you. So roughly 300,000. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hain. Greg, I know uh, we talked a couple of years ago about the welcome centers, the maintenance. How many welcome centers do we have? Do you know offhand throughout the state? We have 13, 13. Not, not rest areas. Rest areas are MDOT only. The welcome centers, we manage the hospitality, are 13. Okay. So, but as far as the maintenance of the, whose who's budget does that come out of? MDOT or? or maintenance is MDOT. So, I think we had that discussion, you know, because I think some of these people come through and they make that one stop. And that might be their impression, because I know... We, I've told you about one of them, uh, the, the condition of them and, and, and maintenance. But if that's something that uh, I don't know how we can talk to MDOT, you know, work together. Because again, we get that one impression and they walk in that restroom and it's nasty maintenance wise. Right. Not just somebody's messed up, but the maintenance. Um, you know, they might not say, oh, there's Mississippi again. Right. And it's an ongoing challenge can, to have that. If we covered. can work together somehow, uh, whoever the contact person over there, and, and what do we can do for these welcome centers? Because it is, uh, I think, very important for these people coming through. They might not stop this time, but they might stop the next time. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Senator Jordan. Uh, have you considered uh, how much is being done on billboards? Because uh, there are some arching of, like Koji, Church of God in Christ started right here in Mississippi, in Lexington, and uh, on 55, <coughs> billboard indicating that would be, would be placed there. You'd have tourism coming here because throughout the world there's 16 to 17 million people who are of Koji religion. And they would like to see the archer if you pass through Mississippi. In fact, that would attract, in my opinion, more people to Mississippi along those lines. I think billboards would be much helpful so people can know what we have here. Many of them don't know what we have here or the history of it. Yes, sir. We, we spend, of all of our billboards, 95 to 99 percent of those are out of state. So we're directing people as they're driving into the state and around to educate them to Mississippi. In-state, uh, we really uh, haven't focused as much on in-state once they're here, but we work with uh, local communities and offer programs to help them if they want to invest in a billboard off Highway 55 or wherever, wherever they're located in the state. And billboard is still, especially the digital billboard industry is very attractive. We're, we're, it's very much a part of our out-of-state campaign, but the 
in-state campaign, especially when we're right now uh, really putting a larger em emphasis on in-state travel, that, that surely could be something that, that we could address. If you can just let me know <coughs> specifically which one that would be. Yes, sir. Anything else from committee members? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of questions, too. Uh, first, could you go back and give us the, um, the uh, percentages of those you say who visit Mississippi? You started with 31%, I think, was family and friends, that list that you gave. Yes. Um, sorry, get to my notes here. This is a, a study, Madam Chairman, that I can send to you. This is our Longwood study. And the, these are just highlights from that study, but this is a new study. But it's 31% of the visitors coming to the state out of the last year, 24.7 million visitors were here to visit friends and relatives. And 29% were here to go to the casinos and resorts. And then fewer than 10% were touring, attending special events, or attending or going to using our outdoor entities, whether it be the beaches, hunting, fishing, biking, in those categories. So number one, 31% to visit friends and relatives and 29% to resorts and casinos. Okay, I'm sorry I started off too, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Representative Deborah Gibbs, Vice Chair of Tourism in the House. Pleasure, yes, ma'am. Good to see you here today. Uh, you also mentioned that, <coughs> as you were talking, that uh, the industry normally is with casinos and shopping and beaches. Are we going to try to expand that or to continue to enhance that? And I'm asking about other industries, such as I know in our college towns, it tends to be sports. Mm -hmm. So when people come in, they come in on Thursday and stay to Sunday. So are we going to try to capitalize on that when family and friends come to town so that we can increase their stay so they're actually getting out spending money as related as it relates to tourism? Yes, ma'am, and, and that's where our partnership with the local CVBs and uh, local tourism industries, our work with them to help promote their towns and their areas. Mississippi, foot, I'll just use football season as an example. Obviously, we're all missing out this, this fall because of COVID, but when you look at just using Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and Southern as examples, seven home games, and just think of the economic impact that would be Thursday through Sunday, and all the hotel rooms and the shopping and the dining is a huge impact. I mean, sometimes 25 to 40 percent increase in that local community and surrounding town that they would benefit during the year. Some, some of these vendors and restaurants, that is their year, the, those seven home games. So we work with, I mean, sports tourism is very important, not just football, but baseball weekends, basketball, and all that uh, entails uh, for people to travel fr from out of state and, and in state as well. So we, sports tourism is very important. There's so much money already through the schools and the towns uh, that are invested in that promotion, but, but we surely, we work with the schools on promoting the schools outside of state as well. But it's sports, sports tourism is very important. It's very much a part of our impact. Hopefully we can do that. I was going to pick it back on uh, my colleague who mentioned about uh, doing more advertising in terms of people who are here. I spoke to a young man who lives here uh, in the city and he had family that came into town from Las Vegas and he wanted to know where could he take his parents and I started naming all these places, all these museums, all their activities and he had no clue. He said, I, I didn't know anything about that but yet he's here in the city, he had no clue of all the things that Mississippi had to offer, offer. So a lot of times they said we were best kept secret because he wasn't even aware of the two museums that we had, the other museums downtown and the sports activities that we normally would have had. So all the nice restaurants and historical pieces behind it. So I think hopefully we can work better together with the CBC and other entities to make sure those of us who are here or in surrounding areas uh, where I have friends who come up for the various games, but they come to a game and then they leave. Mm -hmm. But if they knew there were other activities surrounding that, there's other things that they need to see, you know, perhaps they would make more of a weekend of it than a day of it. Ma'am. Thank you. Senator Boyd. How far does the typical... I don't know the average 
drive, but but our we are a 95% drive-in state. So of all the travelers, uh, the 24.7 million visitors, 95% of those people drove into the state. So um, our if you look at our markets, you know we reach out to Dallas, up to St. Louis, Nashville, Florida Panhandle, our all within that circle is our main advertising reach. So if Dallas, that would be a six hour drive, Nashville, six hours, St. Louis, eight hour drive, and then the Florida Panhandle. So that, that's our, our main radius uh, that we reach out to. Of course, digital marketing uh, reaches out to a further market, but that's, that's our drive in market is, is out to those perimeters. I could get those numbers for you. You know, I, I would just do the average. Uh, it's I'll, I'll use Ole Miss as an example. As, as an alumni, I'm a little more, more familiar with what takes place there. But if you look at Vaught Hemingway, it holds about 62,000 fans, and the Grove holds about 90 to 100,000. So 30 to 40,000. Those people have no intention to go to the game, but are there for the weekend. And you multiply that times seven. So that's a that's a number that that are that's real, and, and then those majority of those people are spending the two to three days, you know, in the in the weekends where the local communities are requiring a two to three night minimum at their hotels for for home games. But I can I can get some more uh, specific numbers for you for the home, because you look at also Delta State, uh, Alcorn State, Jackson State, mm -hmm. uh, all those. Home games, it's a huge impact for that community. It might be five, ten thousand people there for the weekend. Baseball is also a huge draw when you're playing, you know, forty home games at, you know, forty thousand people a weekend for, for games. So the numbers sports in general, I can surely put those numbers together to give an estimate. I have a question. Um, in twenty nineteen, and this is because we have a number of new members uh, to the tourism committee on the Senate side. Uh, we had a hard-fought battle to get a diversion for advertising. How's that working out for us? Well, we're just uh, doing real well. It's accumulating, and it's going as planned as we had worked. It, it accumulated 1% of the restaurant and hotel sales tax. Uh, so this is a diversion of what they paid each month. And, and in the second year, it's 2%, which we're in now. In the third year, it'll be 3%, and then it levels off at 3%. We just had access to the funding this May after it accumulated for approximately a year. And so now we're planning, uh, and then COVID landed upon us, so we haven't been able to really dive into any big programs, which we're planning to in the spring. But the, that uh, dedicated fund right now stands at, uh, after now that we're in the 2% at $4.6 million dollars that's accumulated monthly depending on the industry so we're uh, that and then it would move to three percent next July but it's a two percent right now so those are the funds that we'll be using for all of our marketing advertising program um, uh, this year we do have new two new programs that we've been able to start one which is the first time ever uh, a large uh, digital program with Expedia, which is the long, largest travel network in, in the world, and to be able to advertise with their customer base has, uh, we're really excited. That starts in January, and then we're also, uh, are, we've, we're working with Advanced Travel and for our digital campaign that we're launching this uh, next month. And so the dedicated funding is set up and is working well, but we're just now starting to invest those dollars uh, in a bigger way in the spring and as as we hopefully as most people uh, hearing today would as we work through the through COVID and our restraints I apologize for being late I, I do have another job so I finally got off so yeah. I'm sorry about that um, I finally did see a um, advertisement on television for the Civil Rights Museum just recently. Was that part of that money or was that part of the 13 million? Uh, those ads were placed by Visit Jackson. Okay.
Right, I thought they were really good. Are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Ray? Thank you very much for coming this yeah, afternoon. I, I think we've uh, gotten a good update from you on how the state of visit Mississippi, and we appreciate your time. We know you're very busy and uh, sort of like a water bug. You're all over the place, all over the country, promoting Mississippi. Our next presenter is Linda Hornsby, who's the executive director of the Mississippi Hotel and Lodging Association. Thank you, and thank you for inviting us to take our masks off. Apparently, I can't hear or see or walk in a mask. It, it seems to affect everything. Um, uh, thank you for ha having me here. I'm Linda Hornsby, Executive Director of the Mississippi Hotel and Lodging Association. Um, the, the association was established in 1930 as a 501c3 nonprofit. I was not here then, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, and, and we're basically um, an association to promote the common good of all lodgings in the state. There's so much commonality, and, and um, the hotels are competitors, but they join together more than they don't. And so, uh, because there are so many things that, that are common to, to each of them, or all of them. Um, uh, we have about, um, Let's see, 60, well, this Smith Travel says 62,000 uh, rooms in the state of Mississippi. It's actually more than that because they do not count um, short-term rentals, vacation rentals, Airbnbs, things like that. They do count bed and breakfast, but they don't, um, they don't tabulate the Airbnbs and, and vacation rentals. But that's a, that's a significant number. Um, so, so um, we, and on that note, we use Smith Travel for a lot of our statistics. And even, uh, as Craig will agree, Tom Van Heining and I collab, he's the numbers cruncher guru, and, and uh, he and I collaborate every time a Smith Travel report comes out. And um, because sometimes you have to put a little caveat in there and say, oh, but remember this, and oh, remember, you know, that's when Nate, you know, closed every, Hurricane Nate closed everything down. So things like that, and it kind of explains peaks and valleys um, that otherwise are not obvious. Um, but we do, we do use them um, uh, religiously. We, we get weekly and daily reports, and we get monthly reports that we automatically send out to all of our members. Members, and if any of you are interested in receiving them, I'll give you my email at the end and, and I'll put you on the distribution list. We don't automatically send out the weekly reports because you'd just be inundated with it, but any specific weeks that, that you want, we can send those out. Um, and there's a lot of information on here in case you ever uh, uh, hear it, they call it a star report, STR, Smith Travel Research. Smith family sold it last year, and um, i um, not sure who the new owners are, but they, um, they're, they're the most res respected um, data trackers in, in the world. And um, you'll see three measurements, basically, on, in a star report, and that is occupancy, ADR, which is average daily rate, and REVPAR, which is revenue per available room. I will tell you, occupancy and ADR are no longer the measurements. It's REVPAR, because most of the large resorts, uh, casinos, they're, they're managed by um, uh, the numbers guys, the, the revenue yield managers, and they know how to lower that rate whenever they need to, and then the next hour, raise it up. It, it just is a constant moving target. So occupancy, you know, ADR sometimes determines the occupancy and vice versa, but revenue per available room, rev par, is really the indicator, and, and that's what developers look at. No matter what else is going on, they look at the rev par, and if that's good, then and it, it'll make their numbers work, then you know, hopefully they're in. 
So um, the um, and year over year percentage, if you ever look at a weekly report, which I do a lot, um, just keep in mind that on weekly, uh, the an event such as a holiday doesn't it's not necessarily that same week in the previous year, and that's what the year over year percentages reflect. A good example is Labor Day this weekend, I mean this, this year. Labor Day was on September 7th, it's the latest Labor Day we, we can have, and last year it was se September 2, a completely different week. And so whenever you look at the numbers for the week of Labor Day this year, it looks, wow, it did great, isn't that? It? But it, it, it's not really reflective of that because last year, that week that they compare it to was not Labor Day week. So, so just a little FYI, same thing, um, Memorial Day, you, you know, any holidays that are held on the first Monday of the month or something like that, it's not, it's not necessarily the same uh, year over year um, comparisons. Um, other, other items, other membership benefits that we do, you know, we issue, um, a, we notify all of our members of a government per diem change which starts October 1st. And the new government per diem goes into effect. And we've even had the, the per diem ch in Mississippi changed one time. And uh, it was a fight, but we showed them that their research was incorrect. And so, so we were pretty proud of that. <laughs> so um, uh, we do e-blasts of things that are of importance, and especially with the COVID. We, that, boy, I, uh, you know, my mailbox filled up quickly and we were just sending things out, had to vet it first, make sure it was accurate and, and uh, applicable, but we, we do a lot of e-blasts. Um, and we do resume and employment opportunity sharing. Um, legislation, I'll end with COVID, but I wanted to say something about some recent legislation that was passed, and that is um, House Bill 379. Um, it's a good piece of legislation. It, it went into effect September 1st, and basically it um, changes all of the terms, uh, the definitions of a hotel to include third-party um, marketer, third-party party, uh, facilitator, third-party retailer, and uh, what that does is it puts the onus on uh, entities such as Expedia, which, like Craig said, is the largest uh, tourism facilitator. They, they own, let me tell you what they own, um, they bought out basically their competition. Ingencia, Expedia, Hotels.com, Hotwire, Numinous, Orbitz, and Travelscape. So anytime you go to those sites, you're really at, under Expedia. And anyway, what it, what it does is it tells f facilitators like that that they are responsible for collecting and paying to the state of Mississippi all applicable taxes. Before, it was up to the hotel, and what was happening is um, Expedia, they had a little bit different of a, of a um, business model at that time, but they were buying rooms, and they still do, they, they have a different uh, streams that they get their business from, but they, they uh, were buying rooms from the hotels, buying room inventory at a wholesale price, upping the price to either what the hotel would charge or maybe slightly less and then selling it to the customer, collecting the full amount of tax, paying it to the state of Mississippi at the wholesale rate. So they've changed that, and now any, any monies that are collected by Expedia themselves, not by the hotels, some, sometimes Expedia will, will uh, let the hotel, they'll allow the guests to choose. Do you, do you want to pay us now, in which case your room is probably non-cancelable, or do you want to pay at the hotel? And if the guest chooses to pay at the hotel, and sometimes they do because some people pay with cash, um, if the hotel collects the money, they pay it. No problem with that, the hotels are paying the money. But if Expedia collects it, now they have to pay all taxes, and that includes local 
taxes. Uh, that's city and county, any types of um, room tax, occupancy tax. Well, something came up in the past week. Like I said, this just went into effect September 1st. Expedia sent out an email to all of their hotels that they do business with. And they told them what tax, what uh, monies they need to collect from the guest and pay to the state and which ones they would. Well, they also told um, our, a number of our properties that are 10 rooms or under. Let me use Harrison County for an example. Uh, Harrison County has a tax that it was enacted in 2004, a, an additional 2% room tax, it would, a total of 5% in addition to the 7% sales tax. Um, 2% uh, was enacted in 2004 to go towards paying the debt of the expansion of the convention center. The, um, in that legislation in 2004, they exempted any properties 10 rooms or less. And in this legislation, on line 13 of the summary, let me just tell you what it says. Um, uh, shall, well, basically, what it says is if there is legislation that has previously exempted any properties, then they're exempt unless the Board of Supervisors um, changes and passes a resolution to say exemption no longer applies. Um, I have brought it to the attention of one of the uh, Harrison County Board of Supervisors and she has it placed on the agenda for the meeting um, a week from today and they'll probably have to look at it first, research it, but um, we're hoping that it do it's not going to require new legislation, that it will simply take a resolution by the, the supervisors. There are, other, there are other special taxes throughout the state of Mississippi that fall under this category that are exempted by 10 rooms or less or six rooms or less. And um, Expedia is holding fast on this. So we're, we're gonna you know, get it changed if it needs to be changed or we're gonna get, uh, I think that that um, this supervisor was going to have um, a, Attorney General Fitch look into it and and um, and maybe issue an opinion, and that may take care of it, and then that will be sent to Expedia. Now, whether we can go back and collect uh, all the things they haven't been collecting on those, because I will tell you, there's a lot of properties less than 10 rooms, and. Airbnb, which I will get to next, Airbnb is growing hourly, and those are all single units. And, and if the tax does not apply to them, that's a lot of money left on the table, especially since the, that market is growing at the, at the same time that the hotel uh, market is not. So. It, you know, it's money, it's lost money, so, so um, but those are the type of things that we, we stay on top of and, and, um, and address as needed. Um, COVID-19, uh, of course, it's hit everybody. Uh, the, the first thing that happened right out the door is the AH and LA, American Hotel and Lodging Association, issued something called Hotels for Hope. Maybe you heard about it. It, I hate to say it, but it confused all of the hotels. They wanted to sign up. They went, well, there was, that was just something uh, that they came up with. AH and, LA, AH and LA came up with. What they were referring to was in some states, they anticipated running out of hospital rooms and they wanted to line up hotels. They did it in Louisiana. They took over one whole hotel. They bought one whole hotel's rooms for a certain period of time and used them for hospital rooms. But that, that was done through, in every state, it was done through the health department. And the health department contacted me. And, and they told me, they said, this, 
this is confusing all of the hotels. They're calling it Hotels for Hope. And I said, well, that didn't come from us. And so I issued a clarification. And then we got hotels that are interested. Send me your information. And I provided that to the health department. They have not had to use that because I don't think, I, even though some hospitals came close, they did not have to ever, that I know of, use that, you know, and, and buy rooms at a hotel. Because the thing is, under the circumstances, you would have had to do it just like what they did in New Orleans, is buy the, ho the rooms in the whole hotel. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're spreading the pandemic. So, so um, anyway, that, that was something that we, we came about right away. And, um, and at the same time, about a month, two months ago, I was contacted by MEMA. And they were looking for rooms. It was when um, the threat of Hurricane Laura. And once it was known that it was going into Louisiana, not sure exactly where they were thinking, but they wanted to line up hotel rooms for evacuees. And um, some of those might be people that were quarantined because of exposure to COVID. So that was a little bit of a quagmire, but, uh, and they did, they have enacted that. They, they have used some of those hotel rooms. Um, as far as how we're doing um, in this COVID time, um, I will tell you that Mississippi is outperforming the United States. We're still hurting as far as, as our numbers. Um, but our, just to let you, just to give you a comparison, like I said, RevPAR is the indicator. Mississippi is down 15.2% over last year in RevPAR. That's revenue per available room. The United States is down 47.3. That's as of the August report. And that's for the month of August. Let me see what year to date is. Um, year to date, Mississippi is down 27%. I should have given you that one first. And um, the United States is down 48.9. So we're more than holding our own. We're doing great because great leaders like Craig Ray and, and others on the local level um, getting the word out that we're safe. That's the number one thing that we're promising everybody. And I will tell you, the hotels stepped up. Even the smaller ones that don't have the brands to come and dictate to them do this and this and this and make sure this. Um, the brands definitely, they got, they got the word out right away what their hotels needed to do. And, and then uh, the, the, the state and the CVBs got the word out that we're safe and you feel safe traveling here. And, um, and so, you know, done a, a great job. And like I said, we are, we are doing very, well, not doing very well, but we're doing better than we anticipated March 1st and better than um, some of our, our neighboring states. I think that's all. Are there any questions? Madam Chairman. Yes, sir. Question. Yes. Uh, it's okay, Madam Chair. Okay, how, how, how do we rate as far as full capacity reference to how many people you allow in and lager and so forth? Uh, the capacity for each room is... Not, not for each room, but for the whole hotel, for a hotel. Well, the occupancy year to date in Mississippi is 49.1. 49.1, yeah. that's, that's because of COVID-19 is limited to 49.1. No, oh, you mean as far as rooms operating? Yes. Oh, we're, we're in the good 85 to 90s. Um, some of the larger hotels did not open all their rooms, and they still have not. Casino re resorts, some of the larger ones, are at 50% capacity. And um, that, I, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. And some of the other ones are to, at about two-third uh, capacity. That could change soon, hopefully. You're welcome. I um, really don't have a question. I have a statement. I work for a large company and used to travel all over the state, and now I Zoom. And I worry that uh, for our tourism industry that 
companies may not go back to letting you travel as much. There's nothing like a face-to-face -face visit, but I, I worry in the long run if Zoom is not going to be the the way to go because yeah. our company has saved a ton of money. So. Yeah, I, ho I hope not because there is a value in person to person, that segment of our market and also meetings and conventions is almost non-existent. Right. Ms. Amiri. I may not have understood everything you asked, but the. Let me, let me say it again. Okay. You contact the state health department contact in regards to these hotels and hosts. There are people who are, could need to be quarantined or isolated during this time. Right. Let me clarify. They contacted me saying they, that they, the, health the health department did. I, I don't have the name in front of me, but I do have my notes. Uh, they contacted me saying that they, uh, they were collecting information of hotels that may be interested in signing up if the hospitals um, it's not quarantine people, it's, it's hospitalizations that if the hospitals uh, ran out of rooms. Since that time, and we did, we provided them with information. Actually, we sent out the information to the hotels and said, contact this person. And um, I don't know of any hotels that were leased by the health department um, because they set up field hospitals uh, or field facilities in some cases where needed. That's correct. Okay, so that they didn't say it to me. Maybe it was human services, health and human services. Am I? I, I, I thought it was Department of Health and Human Services, actually. So maybe it was human services if that is a separate uh, department. I know statewide it's the same, but if that's separate from the health department, it was human services. I, I apologize. Yes. For, for the hotels. Yes. My understanding is they did have hotels who were interested. That's what they did. They, they definitely had hotels that were interested. So going forward, that would, might be something that this legislature might want to consider. Hotels that are interested. Yes, we had a, a leading hotel here in Jackson that right away signed up, and he did it knowing it would be a lot of trouble, uh, you know, to accommodate. But he said, you know, we've got to step up. And, and I commend him for that. But there were a number of hotels all throughout the state that signed up. You. You're welcome. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? All right, thank you, Ms. Hornsby, for um, bringing us this information. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Mr. Larry Gregory. He is the executive director of the Mississippi Gaming and Hospitality Association. And uh, Mr. Gregory, you're recognized. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to start off and on behalf of our industry, um, offer our deepest gratitude for doing business here in the state of Mississippi. We've been here since the 90s, and we love 
this state, this industry loves the Mississippi doing business here. We also want to thank the leadership uh, for, for what they've done for us over the years, especially our House and Senate Gaming Committee, uh, uh, Chairman Ure on the House side and Senator David Blunt on our uh, Senate side. And we can't uh, overlook the tourism chairs, uh, Senator Chastanel, Madam Chairman, and, and Madam Chairman Ure, we appreciate you very much for what you've done because tourism is so such an integral part uh, of our industry, so we look at it uh, as a going hand in hand. So starting off today, I'd like to let you know I'm going to speak a little bit about 2019 before 2020 because 2020 there's just not much to report. Actually, it's going to be good news once I tell you uh, where we've been here uh, over the past few months, but but in 2019 is a, a good reflective story about our industry and where it is today. Uh, from indicators around the state, the Mississippi gaming industry enjoyed a prosperous and successful 2019. After the rollout of sports wagering, uh, the industry operators across the Magnolia State have reported that in 2019, they saw increased visitation and new growth, which was great for our industry. In fact, sports wagers in the state's licensed casinos were up an astounding $3.3 million, or 28.9%, for the fourth quarter in 2019 versus the period year over year. The numbers are astounding and were a source of growth opportunities throughout the year as regional professional and college teams provided excitement for local betters. This enthusiasm and renewed guest interest has translated into an almost 4% increase in gross gaming revenue. This comes at an opportune time when many casinos around the state have held special celebrations to mark their 25th anniversary. It's amazing last year for our industry to be here that long. According to the American Gaming Association, 2019 Mississippi casino operators have contributed nearly $1 billion to local governments and almost $5 billion in total economic impact to the state. Looking more closely at the industry's economic impact, you see that in 2019, our casinos generated a total revenue in excess of $3 billion. $2.2 billion of that was gross gaming and $800 million of that was non-gaming revenue. Overall in 2019, the Mississippi gaming industry supported estimated 20,000 direct jobs with a payroll of nearly $712 million benefits of 223, which is almost a billion dollars total. In addition to direct jobs, the industry hosted nearly 24 million visitors with half of those coming from out of state. So we are proud to be a part of the tourism industry uh, here in the state, fourth largest industry, as Senator Chastanel mentioned earlier. Two thousand and nineteen was also another great year of giving back to charities. I will just tell you our industry surpasses a lot of businesses here in our state. I visit uh, all across the straight from, from the state from Tunica to our central region to the Gulf Coast, and we give millions of dollars back uh, in, in uh, dollars to charities and also in work. Uh, performance that, that our casino employees do. Sports wagering was a significant change and opportunity for the state and the industry. It showed innovation and foresight. There's no doubt that retail sports betting has improved both gaming and non-gaming revenue in Mississippi. Most of our operations in the state have reported a noticeable jump in business 
areas during 19, 2019 SEC football season and the New Orleans Saints games is packed in these casinos during that time. Sadly, we're not seeing that, but uh, we saw the benefits last year of what sports betting, and we really thank you all for having the confidence in us to regulate that correctly and bringing people in for sports betting and having such a large increase. Last year was the biggest increase we've had uh, in gross gaming since 2012. So it was our largest year uh, jump in gross gaming. We had a great year. Uh, to continue our success, we must keep our eye to the future and the challenges that lie ahead, growing competition, the millennial customer, and the rapid advancement of new technology. So we need to look at mobile sports betting, cashless wagering, and uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about mobile sports gaming in a minute when I refer to the 2020. Our state has always been at the forefront of change in our industry, and with the continued foresight of state officials like you and the unique spirit of collaboration that exists between the Gaming Commission and our industry leaders, I'm confident we will continue to be successful for the next 25 years. Now I'd like to speak to a little bit about 2020, what's happening. Many of you know we closed those doors in March of this year and 27,000 employees went home. And, uh, but we're kind of used to that in our industry. We've had hurricanes, specifically Hurricane Katrina. We've had oil spills, we've had floods in the Delta, so we're accustomed to that. But we reopened on Memorial Weekend. We were excited that, again, that you leaders gave and the governor gave confidence in our industry to reopen back up. We opened back up at 50% occupancy rate. The table positions were a little less people at the table games, and our slot machines were distributed every other slot machine for social distancing. The numbers came back from the Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> we had a better Memorial Day weekend than we did last year. The numbers were spectacular. We were in awe of that. Then we saw from May to July, and I'm here to tell you since May till the last numbers came out in July, every month, we have outdone year over year, month by month of gross gaming. And uh, that is really uh, surprising and, and uh, confidence in our industry. I think the tourism and the people, we didn't know how people were going to react coming back to casinos with COVID. But we spent a lot of time and effort to make sure, because we have a lot of people that come to our properties and we wanted to make sure they were safe and, uh, and I think they believed in us and we did that. No doubt we've had success in sports betting and we thank you for allowing this to take place. However, we must always ensure the industry remains competitive and strong so it continues to be a healthy contributor to the Mississippi economy. So I would expect you will be seeing legislation in 2021, allowing mobile sports betting to come forth here in Mississippi. Our association is gathering data to present at a hearing scheduled by our chairman on the Senate side, David Blunt, Senator Blunt, in December. We will be giving him information regarding this issue. And also Chairman Ure on the House side has requested the same information. So we're providing that to him also. In closing, I reiterate that 2019 was an amazing year, and we're proud of the many successes of our industry in the state. It's one of the best years in recent history. Although 2020 has been challenging, we will get through this. Our industry has overcome, as I mentioned, hurricane floods, oil spills. Success and prosperity will return to our industry. We're grateful for the opportunity to be a strong part of this state's great economy. 
Thank you very much. It's an honor to speak before you today. I'll answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, you spoke to the fact, talk about mobile sports betting. You know, you and I have talked about that uh, along with Senator Blunt several times. Um, can you imagine the times that we're in right now with, with the seasons beginning, if we could use this, what your numbers would be today? Well, that'd be very speculative. If I told you that about sports betting, I would have been way off. I had no idea what we, we did. But I will tell you, if we allow sports betting, um, uh, mobile sports betting, um, uh, it will be very beneficial to the state. Of course, you know what the state gets tax-wise. And um, I think um, the numbers would be exceedingly um, well, high for mobile spend spending. They're going to be phenomenal. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. There are about 20 plus thousand back right now. 20,000 plus. We're not laid off, but I mean, they're just not, I mean, we're in the process of reopening right now. But we plan on, we're, our intent is to bring all the employees back. Um, and they may be back right now. I, I'm not checked because I don't get into the daily operations of the casinos, but. But, uh, but our intent is to bring them back. We're doing well, so I think that's uh, well on the way of getting all the employees back. We have another question, I believe. Yes, Mr. Chairwoman, thank you. Uh, Director Gregory, I have a question. As far as how it breaks down, like I think gaming is doing very well on the coast, but it may not be doing so well in the north end of the state. How does that break down as far as the, the industry? Uh, you said you gave some numbers about how much revenue it's generating. Break that down percentage. So let's say Highway 82 is the dividing line. So break that down the south versus the north for me. Well, I'll just tell you the majority of the gross gaming is coming from the coast right now. Uh, uh, the central region is, is, is uh, maintaining their own um, over the past few years. But Tunica, as we all know, um, has been on a downturn. There's been a couple of casinos that have closed over the past few years um, in, in Tunica. And um, uh, there's been a lot of challenges with other states around. Arkansas, for example, now offers um, commercial gaming. And then Tennessee's looking at sports betting. And, and uh, uh, the, the competition up there has just been fierce. And um, so and, and, and the only number I do remember about um, uh, Tunica. I do remember back around 2005, I was the director of the Gaming Commission um, uh, back in the 90s and up until 2011, I believe. And Tunica itself, I mean, Mississippi was the third largest gaming jurisdiction. We reached a $3 billion gross gaming revenue state. And we had Las Vegas or Nevada, then we had Atlantic City, and then we had Mississippi, but it was not actually Mississippi. Actually, it was Tunica. They were the third largest in the country. So we have gone from there to just fierce competition, and they have gone down um, uh, over the years, or the last couple of years. And uh, But we've got some still there, still maintaining. It's a good, healthy market for the ones that are staying. And um, But I can get you those numbers. I have them somewhere. I can get them uh, to you right after the hearing in your opinion what could we do as a state to to help those uh, facilities in in tunica county specifically what could be done to to turn some of that around do you think well there has been different consulting firms looking at that and there's no doubt you got to have something to bring people in i mean if you look at that mississippi gulf coast mm -hmm. I mean, look what just opened here a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the aquarium. I mean, I think they were looking at bringing in 500,000 people 
a year. Uh, I mean, that, that's huge numbers. And, uh, but you have so many things to offer. You have the fishing and such and all the things on the Gulf Coast and Vicksburg and the museums and everything else at the Central Park and the Delta. Who wouldn't want to go and spend a night or two in the Delta? I mean, it's just great. All the history and all the music and everything, museums they have there. But the Tunica is just lacking some type of infrastructure to bring people in and that would be my answer to you it's been looked at over the years and and uh, that seems to be the number one source to have some amenity um, outside of gaming we don't need another casino i believe we need something there to bring people in in your opinion it's it's not just gaming that's bringing people to Mississippi. You think it's a, a, a total package as far as a destination? Oh, there, there's no doubt it's a total gaming. You know, you know, when people come, I mean, they do like to game. They like to gamble when they're here. But Mississippi offers so much more. And from the very get-go, I was here in the 90s from the get-go when this thing kicked off. And our whole thing was to couple it with what Mississippi has to offer. We never wanted to become a gaming destination. We wanted people to come from Mississippi and see and participate what we have, and whether that's the music, and whether that's the, uh, the waters, and the, you know, the Gulf Coast, and all throughout the state what we have. And uh, so we, we uh, couple that with uh, other amenities that are throughout the state yeah, and our culture. As the executive director of the, of the Gaming and Hospitality Association, if you had, you know, if you were in complete ch charge of the funds, what could we do in your mind to help the county of Tunica and make it a destination, in your opinion? Well, the, if there's any way that we can get some type of industry there, um, uh, employing thousands of jobs. I think there's some up there already, manufacturing sites already there. Uh, any, any type of industry or any type of amenities uh, that y'all could help on, um, you know, bonds of some sort. And um, uh, th that is just desperately needed. And Tunica is going to need that or they're not going to go up. I mean, they're going to need that and uh, with, with the state's help, assistance, to work along with that county um, uh, to, to uplift it somewhat. Th thank you for trying to address my questions. Madam Chairman, thank you. Representative Scott, did you have a question? Well, there's been talk of that over the past few years, and uh, for some that may not understand what we're speaking of, you know, the Katrina and the, uh, and the Coast Casinos could come back on land due to the hurricanes. And so since that time, there was a lot of flooding in Tunica, 
they had to close down and uh, not to the extent like the Gulf Coast over hurricanes, but they did shut down. And uh, actually in 2011, when the major flood came through there, that's, if I had to give you an explanation of what was the demise of Tunica, it was that shutting down in that 2000 flood, and there was another casino called Southland uh, over in West Memphis, Arkansas, and who just offered slots and kind of third-rate type slot machines. But when we shut down there, people from Memphis, and that's a big market for Tunica, and they ended up at Southland, and they never did come back. You know, convenience gaming, they said, hey, why do I want to drive 30, 40 minutes to Tunica when I can? And that was, that was the downfall right there in 2011, and it's just been going. Now, there's been talk about having the casinos go from where they are in the water there to Highway 61 right there, and not too far from the waters. But uh, after looking at it, our industry specifically, uh, it would be difficult, I think, and this is just me hearing from a lot of the developers and such, to have such a major investment. They're not going to pack up their bags from where they are now and go invest, you know, $500, $750 million for a new property. It just doesn't make sense for a lot of them. So I don't think there's a push as it once was. I think this came up a couple of years ago, and it's kind of petered out since that time. But uh, so I don't think our industry is, is pushing any type of legislation to come land-based. No, I'm saying our industry is not uh, uh, looking at moving land base. I think we are, we've made the billions of dollars of investment of where we are now, and the market, like other markets, we're not the only lone wolf out there. I mean, there's a lot of gaming casinos that w went down because of the economy and whatever the reasons, numerous ones, and Tunica suffered from that. Vicksburg and uh, the Delta part, they've not suffered, or, or the Gulf Coast, but Tunica has due to competition and, and other reasons, but I don't think uh, just by the mere fact of letting them go land base that they're going to invest at this time. Well, you know, the legislature... Yes. Okay. Are there any further questions for Mr. Gregory? Well, we thank you for coming this afternoon and giving us this, this information. Um, we're going to move in another direction. At this point, we're going to hear from Mrs. Katie Blunt, who is uh, by far the better half of the Blunt family, <laughs> and she is going to tell us about uh, our uh, archives and history, which is so important to Mississippi's tourism industry. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and thank all of you. I, I want to begin by thanking the entire legislature uh, for your longtime support for the Department of Archives and History. Uh, Mississippi's State Historic Agency is known as one of the strongest and most effective in the country, and I can say that because it's been true since long before I came, became director. And the reason is that we have always had the support of the state and the state's leadership. And that is not true in every state, and it makes a tremendous difference. So I'm grateful for that. I want to thank you especially for your support for the two Mississippi museums and the, uh, the increase in marketing money uh, that the state has made available since we opened in 2017. It's made a tremendous difference to us and will continue to uh, in, in the future. 
I want to thank our tourism partners. Craig Ray is a great partner. The Mississippi Tourism Association, I mentioned the uh, marketing that, that Visit Jackson has done for us. Uh, we are all in it together in the tourism industry, and, and we count on our partners, and uh, we try to help them too. Uh, this collective uh, effort has led to huge success at the two Mississippi museums. Uh, since we opened in December of 2017, we have welcomed nearly half a million visitors. And they've come from every state in the country and from dozens and dozens of, of countries around the world, uh, every um, continent except Antarctica, but we're not done yet. Um, and I think the, the impact uh, the museums have made in the media, the very positive reception, uh, the number of visitors. Uh, we've really changed people's perceptions of Mississippi. Uh, we've changed our perceptions of ourselves, I think, too. But we've showed people what we can do. Uh, and the main thing is, I think we've opened their eyes to the power of our stories. And as I always say, these are not just Mississippi stories. The stories we tell here are central to American history. Of course, we have taken a hit with coronavirus. Uh, we were closed for months. We reopened our museums in, at the beginning of July. We've been very careful to, uh, to stay in line with the governor's uh, restrictions. Uh, so we are, we are only now really uh, fully opening up and beginning to uh, uh, market. We're, we're, we're leading a, a new marketing initiative now, marketing our wonderful uh, temporary exhibit, uh, Mississippi Distilled, about prohibition and alcohol in Mississippi. Nell Knox, who's our point person for tourism uh, at the Department of Ar Archives and History, is going to give you some flyers. You've all got my phone number. Give me a call if you want to come over, bring some pages, bring some constituents. We will uh, arrange for that. This exhibit is a lot of fun, and we're it says there that it's about to end, but we're keeping it open well into next year to give people a chance to see it. Uh, we're resuming our public events. We do a very popular holiday event, uh, Christmas at Candlelight. We get over a thousand people every year. They go in the governor's mansion and come to our sites and we run the, the trains at, at the holidays. We will do that again this year. We're about to uh, start welcoming people back into the museums for our History is Lunch program, a very, very popular lunchtime lecture once a week that attracts sometimes hundreds of people. Uh, we've been doing it remotely, uh, and we've taken the opportunity to really enhance our remote engagement with the public, and we'll continue to do that, but we want, we want to see our, our friends in the museums, too. Uh, so we're really focused on that and confident that we can lift the numbers back up uh, as we continue to open up. Uh, we are also moving forward on our long-term vision for the department um, and for tourism in Mississippi working with our partners. Uh, the legislature, we didn't feel this way at the time, Robert and I uh, and others, but when the legislature uh, provided the initial funding for the two museums and required us to raise a dollar for dollar match for the exhibits, you did us a tremendous favor. We, we raised that money, we raised $20 million for the two museums and we, we built relationships with funders uh, inside the state and outside. We've been able to bring a tremendous amount of money from national foundations and corporations uh, into the state um, to build these museums and we are continuing to raise money to endow a, uh, school visits into the future so that we have baseline visitation uh, every year and, and that we can reach all of our school children. That is our most important priority and we're continuing to work on that. Um, we're also uh, building on the success of the museums and the success of our fundraising uh, effort to make a difference around the state. Um, we're working with partners in the Natchez region, uh, the National Park Service, Visit Natchez, Historic Natchez Foundation, and others, uh, to revitalize what is already a very strong tourism uh, industry in that region. Uh, the people who are coming here for the two Mississippi museums need to go to Natchez, and I think they will. Uh, we've, the, 
restoration of Windsor Ruins, which has always been a popular site, uh, is underway now, and we thank you for your support for that through the Community Heritage Preservation Grant Program. Uh, when that restoration is finished, uh, the, the columns will look the same, but they will not be in danger of falling. Uh, we will reinterpret that site and promote it uh, more aggressively than we ever have before, and we know we can boost the visitation there. Uh, our next priority at the beginning of 2020 was to build a new museum at Grand Village of the Natchez Indians, which is a National Historic Landmark. It's one of the most interesting and significant sites in the state uh, and has always had a strong visitation, a lot of people interested and in, uh, strong program, strong leadership at that site. We hadn't put any money into it in decades and we had a vision to, to build a new museum at that site and some enhanced outdoor facilities that we could use for facility rental. And we were gonna do it without coming to y'all. We were gonna do it with uh, local public money, private fundraising, and we were also looking at federal money. Uh, we still think we can do this, but the local private money was going to get us, I'm sorry, the local public money was going to get us started. Uh, we were part of a package of um, a, a local bond issue uh, package that the city and county had put together that was to be paid off by an increase in a new tourism tax. Obviously, this is not the time. We're gonna, we're gonna wait a minute um, and let the tourism industry rebound a little bit and then we'll go back. We've, we've laid a lot of groundwork, done a lot of uh, work down there with our partners and I think, I think that plan can work and I know that we can raise private money on top of that. So we are just, uh, we're just waiting until the right time for that plan. But meanwhile, we're moving forward with our vision for historic Jefferson College, which as you know, is the birthplace of the state, a beautiful, beautiful site uh, with a beautiful collection of historic buildings just outside of Natchez. Uh, our vision is to restore the buildings uh, year after year, working through the Community Heritage Preservation Grant funds again and then to uh, develop a museum exploring the rich history of that region. Uh, it's a fascinating history and we're doing a feasibility study now to, um, to explore the best way to, to move forward with this project. Uh, as is true of the two Mississippi museums, this will not be a local history museum or even a state history museum. Uh, the stories that visitors will learn in the Natchez area really are central to our nation's history. And that's the way we'll tell the stories and that's the way we'll promote the site. Uh, when existing sites like the two Mississippi museums, Vicksburg National Military Park, which has uh, ambitious expansion plans there for their visitor center, uh, and already a strong visitation there. When these sites are linked with <coughs> new or expanded sites like the Medgar Evers House here in Jackson, which is now uh, being run by the uh, National Park Service and they're working to open that as a National Park Service site. They're also looking at possible expansion uh, in up to other civil rights sites in Mississippi. We've been working with them on that and we hope it will happen. Uh, that site, the restored Windsor ruins, Grand Village with the new museum, and, and Jefferson College restored and with the new museum. When these places open and when they are linked through marketing, uh, visitors will come and they will experience these places as they never have before. Uh, they'll understand the Native American experience, cotton and slavery, civil war, uh, the civil rights movement, and our rich uh, cultural, musical, literary heritage as they never have before. And they'll understand America like never before because again, these stories are central to our nation's history and central to understanding our experience as Americans today. And not incidentally, this network of experiences will continue to increase visitation from outside Mississippi, building a powerful tourism uh, industry well into the future. I thank you for your leadership and support as we move forward with this vision and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions or comments from Mrs. Blunt? All right, Senator Jackson. In regards to the, um, the flag changing 
tourism as a result of Mississippi? Well, for one thing, I think the state attracted a lot of attention um, in, in making that transition. Uh, I know that we at Archives and History uh, experienced a huge jump in our, in our contacts on our uh, social media, uh, huge jump in traffic. There was wide, wide interest uh, nationwide and beyond. We had flag submissions. When we opened it up to, to invite people to submit their flag ideas, we had them from all over the world. Uh, next time we're going to put a limit on that, but um, no, there won't be a next time. Um, but so I think that that's true, first of all, uh, raised our profile in a very positive way. Um, and I think that, uh, that this, that people see through this experience that Mississippians are taking an honest look at our history. Um, and that we're moving forward together, again, in a very positive way. Uh, so I think it will have a, absolutely have an impact. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, Director Blunt, I wanted to thank you for your work in this state. I've, I've toured several of the um, museums and have opportunities to visit with you on occasion, and I really value um, how much you care about the history and your your professionalism and work over there and thank you I, I appreciate that I, I did not want to miss this opportunity to say that uh, you exemplify the very best a lot of times and a bureaucrat people think of that as a dirty word but you're actually a very good state employee I appreciate that I'm I appreciate very, you thank you thank you I really appreciate that appreciate that I am very very proud to have spent my entire career uh, working for the state of Mississippi and uh, again, my colleagues around the country look at, at us and, and really envy uh, the um, support that we have from the people and the elected officials of the state for preserving, interpreting, and sharing our history. And they also envy the, the richness and power of the stories themselves. Any other questions or comments? Well, I guess I would be remiss not to also echo those sentiments. You've been very helpful in the things that I've tried to do and always been accommodating. I can't say that for all state <laughs> head agencies. So I definitely want to make sure I publicly say I appreciate you in terms of your uh, demeanor and always willing to help and offering your staff and the museum any way you can to advance the positive things we're trying to do in the state of Mississippi. Thank you, Representative Gibbs. I appreciate that. We have a wonderful staff. And we'll talk more about that during the legislative session. Senator Jordan. Uh, Chair, uh, are you fully open now? Or are you... We are fully open at the two Mississippi museums, although we have not fully resumed our public programs. Uh, some of our sites um, we have not fully opened, and, and what we did was look to the ones with the highest visitation first and the highest potential to make positive uh, economic impact. Um, but we're gradually reopening all of them. Representative Haney. I know you're open five days a week. We are open seven days a week. Are we right now? Six. No, Six I right just now. Had some tourists say they closed. Oh, well, that's right. We're closed on Mondays. <laughs> that's Sunday, why Robert has Sundays? to come because I tell lies. Sundays too? No, we're open on Sundays. I met some earlier and they, I asked them if they'd been over there. They said they closed on Monday, so I didn't know. That's just a kind of museum, museum standard uh, really around the world. A lot of museums are closed on Mondays. They have to be closed sometime for cleaning and maintenance and that kind of thing. And so that's something tourists are used to. All right, if there are no further questions or comments, we thank you very much for coming and giving us an informative overview of um, our Historic tourism, cultural and heritage tourism is what I ask her to come and talk about. So thank you very much. And we look forward to the projects that you're about to undertake. I appreciate the uh, invitation and your time and attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is a person that I met several years ago. And um, I never thought about agritourism or uh, the, the rural tourism initiative and what, what a big impact it has. We thought that this might be a, time, a good time to bring in Dr. Daryl Jones since so many people are looking for outside uh, venues to uh, enjoy 
uh, tourism opportunities. So Dr. Jones is here. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for coming. Thank you, Senator Chastanel. It's great to be here. Uh, Chairwoman Chastanel and I go back a while. I've, I've always uh, been delighted that we're good friends and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of this distinguished group today, uh, senators and representatives. As Chairwoman Chastanel mentioned, I work, I guess the best way to describe it would be in rural tourism. I'm a wildlife professor at Mississippi State University, uh, and I work firsthand with landowners around the state, private landowners, to look at opportunities to diversify income on their private lands, on their properties, and also to do conservation. So I've got a background just quickly on me. I used to be a banker. My daddy was a career banker with First National Bank of Vicksburg. It's now Trustmark, and every little boy wants to be what his daddy was. So I was a banker for seven years and then went back and was trained in wildlife um, and also marine science and ended up with, it, with my home department, Mississippi State Wildlife Fisheries and Aquaculture, and I'm employed by the Mississippi State Extension Service. So what I'm going to do is talk about some numbers related to rural tourism in the state. And it's one I think uh, you can think of as being somewhat buffered from some of the COVID-19 fears. You know, if you're, if you're coming hunting in Mississippi, you're getting away from people. And you're coming to rural areas, Warren County, Tishomingo County, Hancock County. So it's an opportunity to kind of get away from the hustle bustle of your, your busy life and you're getting away from folks, but you're spending money in the state and a good chunk of this income is going to uh, rural communities in the state. So that, I think that means a lot. So what I'm gonna be drilling down on a little bit is recreation on private lands, and you can also think of it on public lands too, like state wildlife management areas, national forest, national wildlife refuges that we're fortunate to have in the state. So hunting, fishing, the watching of wildlife or seeing pretty vistas and watersheds and lands that we have in Mississippi, and we've got a lot of that. And that's an asset, I think, that we have in the state, for sure. Uh, horse trail riding, farm tours, agritourism, as, as Senator Chastanel mentioned, and then bed and breakfast opportunities, rural accommodations. These are numbers taken every five years from the U.S. Department of Interior. So every five years, Interior, specifically with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, conduct a national survey to look at what people spend on wildlife-related recreation going outside. And so you can see, and this, this, this is being ramped up to be done again, the last time I saw this five years previous to this, it was $122 billion. It's gone up to $157 billion annually spent in the United States on wildlife-related recreation. And it breaks out, as you'll see, hunting, $26 billion, almost $50 billion in fishing. And this can include our Gulf Coast communities with saltwater fishing. And then wildlife watching, people going to Rolling Fort, Mississippi to see the wood storks come through or waiting birds, other waiting birds come, th come through, almost 80 billion annually spent in the United States. And Senator Chastanel, I'll mention if you're interested in these slides, they're on the computer and I wanted to give those to you, Senator for your distinguished members here that they can, they can use. And, and, and I'm always a contact for you, obviously, for, for numbers like this. So boiling down a little bit, several years back, this survey would look at individual states. They don't do that now, unfortunately. That'd be one thing I wish they'd come back to do. Maybe they will. But uh, several years before that, they were drilling down to each individual state. So what I did, is I took numbers spent in Mississippi. This is by resident Mississippians and non-resident folks. I live in Winston County. I'll go on a little rabbit chase just a minute. I live in Winston County, Mississippi, and we have all my grandparents' land, mama's land. And west of us is the Campbell Group, which used to be old Georgia Pacific land. 
it's le- and as you well know, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, timber companies lease all their ground for hunting. And that property there, I can't remember the acreage west of our property line, every year folks from New Orleans come to hunt that, mostly deer, and they've bought property there locally and bring all their camps and whatnot, and they, we have them all Christmas. So they stay during, during the, uh, the deer, whitetail deer season here, and so they're coming to rural Mississippi and spending money there in Louisville and the neighboring county. So in looking at Mississippi, what I did is I took those expenditures and, and cranked it through an econometrics model to look at the economic impact. So this is economic impact to the state of Mississippi of hunting, fishing, and watching wildlife. Hunting on an annual basis produces 1.5 billion in economic impact, fishing almost 900 million, watching of wildlife nearly a billion. So inflated to today's numbers in 2020, about 3.3 billion representing uh, creating over 70,000 jobs. So it means it's uh, being nat- natural and in Mississippi rural lands, but it's economic impact, as y'all well know, to the state. Let me diverse a little bit into some of the areas of this, and I do a lot of this with hunting, being a wildlife professor, and just drilling down a little bit on leasing land for hunting. Our price ranges in Mississippi, based on last surveys that I've done looking at lease lands in the state, they can shoot the gamut of per acre prices, but it goes from five to $65 an acre a year. And better properties are in that upper end. When I say better, you have mixed uh, hardwood pine stands, bottomland hardwood, also ag grounds associated with that. Good places, good habitat for wildlife. So it's good hunting property. People want to lease it. And we have a lot, we must be a really good destination for folks buying land. Land adjacent states to ours are, is higher. So people are buying out of state are coming in and buying Mississippi land at a pretty good clip. So we're, we're a good market for that. And they're buying it for recreation. And so on these better properties with good timber, uh, also ag ground, you got wetland areas of water. It's the leasing prices per acre, about $21 an acre. And that, that amount is going up every year is what I see. I get called a lot regarding what can I lease my property for. So again, this is rural landowners in your local counties that are doing this. And a lot of these numbers are missed. This is going on all the time and we're not really monitoring, you know, there's no one there catching that. So this is, and I, I try to, but there's good economic impact, I think, in this. 16th section lands that y'all are more familiar with than me, obviously, for local school districts. On average, 16th section land, last survey uh, that Dr. Ian Munn did at Mississippi State, about a seven to $11 per acre. But some of that ground can go much higher than that, particularly in the lower delta. Uh, Delbert Hoseman put those properties with, when he was Secretary of State on a bid basis through the website. And, and as y'all know, anytime there's competition for bids, the price typically will kind of uh, inch up a little bit. So those prices are coming up as well. Uh, I do a lot in pricing leases I talked about, and some of my comments you can tell are kind of geared more toward some of the training I do with landowners and look at, at least get your land taxes, look at other leases in the area, and I get called a lot on this. There's a rural land study that I mentioned as lease prices that I just wanted to mention just quickly. Um, I had about 800 properties in the state that were bought for recreation by in-state residents and out-of-state. And the, the, the properties were financed by a federal land bank. And the land bank worked with me to have, I had access to their loan portfolios, not people's names, but what they bought it for. About a third of the value of Mississippi lands in this study was due to wildlife related recreation. In addition to timber, ag, commercial development, but wildlife related, buying it to hunt. Land types are important, as you can see, I've already mentioned forested and agricultural land, ended up being about a third of the value of Mississippi rural lands was due to this. People buying it for wildlife related recreation, buying it to hunt on. $634 an acre, about a 34% of the land value. Fee fishing continues to grow. This is quite compatible with hunting operations as well. 
Uh, we at the Extension Service, we work a lot with fish management. We have uh, extension specialists in pond management, and we give that kind of advice and help recommendations to landowners quite, quite a bit. Charter boat industry, uh, one of the bigger things that, that kicked this out of the saddle some years back was the Deep Horizon oil spill that has some impacts to the natural environment on the Gulf Coast. But in the last surveys, this is somewhat dated that we did as a, I had a graduate student do this survey. I was in, a member of his committee. The charter boat industry generated about 9.1 million on an annual basis with most of that, over 8 million remaining in the three, on the three coastal counties. And on average, a full-time saltwater guide was averaging about 71,000 in income a year. Offshore locations were, were fished predominantly, but they fished off, offshore and inshore in some of the estuaries. Agritourism, farm to, tours continues to grow worldwide. This is one of the fastest growing tourism markets. We see the impact from last surveys that I've been involved with in Mississippi, about 150 million dollar economic impact on an annual basis with vision of Senator Chastanel and, and you and others in the Senate and the House. The Agritourism Limited Liability Law has helped there. That gives some inherent protection to farm tour operators that open their lands up for farm tours that if I go out there and step in a stump hole and turn my ankle, they're not going to get potentially sued for the property. Uh, so that's, that's, that's something the law has quite helped with agritourism. Um, and if I had a, had a wand, we could wave it for all these industries that I'm talking about. That would help. Um, but, but thanks to this law, this helps agritourism operators. Birding, the wildlife watching, this is a main focus of this. About 25% of Americans participate. I'm an avid hunter. As older I get, I don't shoot as much. You know, I love to turkey hunt, but as I get to be an old man, I don't want to walk out there and get shot in the head. So I like to look at that old gobbler. You know, y'all know what I mean by that. But I beca I've become more of a, a birder now. So lots of people spend money and travel all over the world to add species of birds to their life list. And Mississippi is a big time destination for that because of the habitats we have and the, the variety of bird species, neotropical migrants, wading birds, waterfowl that come through the state and use habitat in the state. Obviously compatible with hunting. Um, and this is something that's continuing to grow. Horse trail riding, another thing that is popular in the state. Lots of horse folks come, they stay on in their camp trailers, stay in their horse trailers and ride on private lands and on lots of times adjacent public lands. I couldn't find any Mississippi numbers. Minnesota did some survey work and you can see about 50 million expenditures annually in the state of Minnesota uh, supporting jobs there. Shooting sports. I don't necessarily want a shooting range on my property, but this is tremendously popular statewide. I, I do this as well. I've done uh, workshops in other states and actually hosted an event in Indiana on a property that was a shooting sport destination. So some landowners really capitalize this. 20 million participate, spend almost 17 billion annually and it supports a number of jobs. So Mississippi, I think, is steep with some of these other things that have already been talked about, rural accommodations, music, culture, literature, history of the South and of Mississippi. We have that rural appeal which draws people here like no other state, almost. And the, fam the sense of family tradition is strong and people like to come and meet you as you being from Mississippi. I'm gonna let this sign just sink in just a little bit. <laughs> I get questions, the number one question I get other than how much can I lease my property for is can I shoot a trespasser? I said, sure, you can shoot a trespasser. It's just not legal to do that. But one thing that getting a little bit from the comedy here a little bit, this is a, something that a lot of folks are concerned about, people trespassing on their properties. And so I do a lot of talking about things to ways they can prevent this and get around problems. But at the workshops I do, over half of the attendees that come from Mississippi that are rural landowners are absentee landowners. They don't live on the property. 
And one of the things I work with them, like, well, if you have people that are there checking on it, maybe he leasing it for hunting, they're looking at it and checking it so you don't have people running over it. Uh, but the next question, am I going to get sued if a trespasser gets hurt on a property? No, no, typically not. I mean, you don't owe any duty to a trespasser. He or she's not supposed to be there. You can get sued for anything, but, but typically... You're, you owe no duty. But on that note, we don't have time. I spend a lot of time, though, with landowners talking about legal issues, and so these are some of the things I talk about. You don't have to make, I don't have to make my property perfectly safe, just what a reasonable and prudent person would do to eliminate hazards and notify my guests of the hazards. There's a mean bull on the back 40. Don't go back there. Ferdinand's back there. Doing things to warn them and then documenting that I'm doing that with well-written agreements like leases, have an attorney review it, use of liability waivers, having insurance, a business structure with the use of limited liability corporations, things like this. So my banking background and legal background, I bring this in, economics in with the land management, with habitat management. I run this program here at Mississippi State, or attempt to, where we try to deliver this type of information, timely information to landowners that are interested in diversifying income on their property, and these are some of the things that try to do with income diversification and conservation in Mississippi. Um, hosted over 100 landowner workshops in the nation, and most of them in Mississippi, where you talk about these kind of issues on the land base or with COVID, we do a lot of, I do a lot of webinars now, and involve you as community leaders, have presentations from professional and other landowners. Landowners like to hear from other landowners. Uh, so take advantage of that to give them good how-to information and do a lot of advanced training with habitat management, land management, and then things like writing a business plan. Some of the results uh, that I've done with the program, not patting myself on the back, but I think it goes to the interest that we have here. And surveys I've done since 2010 to current, we've, uh, I've been able to initiate over 500 NREs uh, have started generating about eight million in annual revenues per year annually. Land ownership of about 700,000 acres in 27 different states. I've done events in 12, most of them in Mississippi, uh, and been able to improve conservation on the land base. And there's a high level of interest from landowners to do more of this. And so I think the punchline is what I would say rural tourism continues to grow. It's buffered from some of the climatic things going on with disease and some, and even some with economic downturns or economics going up. People still buy land. They're still traveling to do these kind of activities. Quality lands mean a lot. Habitats are important for the wildlife, for people to have a good experience. I tell landowners in the entertainment business, even if they're leasing, people like to come and talk to them. I've had some landowners tell me, you know, I'm interested in a farm tour, but I just don't like kids. And I said, well, we might want to rethink that. <laughs> but if you like to tell your story and you enjoy to involve in people, this may be your ticket. And people, landowners do really well at this in addition to farming and in addition to timber, uh, timber production. So good for income diversification, conservation of Mississippi to keep people visiting the state and this is a growing industry. That's my contact information there, and I would be delighted to entertain any questions and work with you in the future, Senator DeChastanol, any way that I can. Thank you. I'd like to mention that this is a uh, House and Senate uh, hearing today, and this is the chair of the House Committee who has a question, and then we'll recognize Senator Jordan. Thank you. I, I am Representative Curry, and I would love this information as well if you could get it to me. I'm, I'm the chair of the House uh, Committee, and we're this year looking to help our state parks. You know, we have ignored them pretty much ever since I've been here. I'm in my fourth term, and, you know, they are the safest place for a lot of people to come into the state, pull your RV, and when I look here at wildlife watching right. for 974 million, That's right. what are we thinking? That's right. So I, I need this information to bring to that committee meeting and may call you for that if that's all right. Be delighted to. And Thank this you. is stuff that's already going on. 
Mm -hmm. uh, people are already coming to do that. And, and for example, on private lands, they're, they've already got the land. So it's not like you've got to spend a lot of money to get involved with this. This is already happening. And I think, we, in my opinion, we can grow this. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Jordan. If, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Jones, how, Sir. did I hear you say how many species of birds in Mississippi? Uh, I don't know that answer, but there's a lot. We have tremendous songbird diversity because of our land base uh, with natural habitats and then the uh, forested land base and then the ag land with cereal grain production offers a lot of food. Infinite number of songbirds, um, wading birds like roseate spoonbills, uh, wood storks all the waterfowl species, and these come through the state, through the Mississippi Delta, through our watersheds, lower Pascoe River, and end up on the coast. So uh, we, we have a number of bird species, and people come here uh, quite a bit to look at bird species. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, yes, sir. Tom H. Had, had down to study with some of the students there at the university. Yes, sir. Uh, what about in the past we have had uh, statements about waste and disease for deer. Yes. Has that been eradicated yet? No, sir. That's, that's something, unfortunately, we may not ever get rid of. Uh, that's a, um, it's a prion, kind of a protein that's malformed and wants white-tailed deer. It, it actually originated in the Midwest in sheep. Um, and and it's gotten to deer species, and it was in northern states. And that's one uh, disadvantage, and, and I don't want to step on any, any toes here. One thing in moving wildlife that can be um, a problem if you move deer and you're not sure of what they may have, it's like bringing a kid with a flu and putting him in a classroom. So we've got chronic waste and disease now, and there's just going to be something we'll have to endure that storm and get through it. Uh, lots of the hunting numbers that you showed that I showed you are white-tailed deer related. So we could take a slip in that if we lose a portion of our deer herd uh, due to chronic waste and disease. Um, one thing, and I'm on a sidebar, but I'll just mention since you were asking those good questions, the. Floods are devastating, and we hate we have those, but that may have been one thing on a background point of view that may have been good. It reduced the deer herd. And so when you, you reduce your densities, you have less opportunity to, to transmit disease. So that may have inadvertently kind of helped. Um, but chronic waste and disease would be something we'll have to deal with, and hopefully it won't tremendously impact the deer herd. It might, probably will. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Dr. Jones, on, yes, the, sir. on the slide with the agritourism, yes, sir. 150 million dollars is that in Mississippi? Yes. Yearly? Yes. Yes. And actually, that's probably uh, that was ballparking some numbers we had. I had earlier. We've had. We've got more with with uh, Commissioner Gibson with agritourism. Started with Lester Spell, Dr. Spell. Um, and certainly Cindy Hyde-Smith helped this quite a bit as well, uh, bringing on agritourism destinations and having that limited liability law, as you know, uh, we've got more farms that are operating, offering these, these op opportunities. So I think that number can certainly, can certainly grow. COVID may have a little impact on that, but people are always looking you know, we're going to all live in Atlanta one day. So it just keeps coming this way. But if you can get kids out on a rural land base, uh, it's showing where food and fibers produce and where wildlife live. Uh, I think that's a good thing. So that number, I think, will jump in, in coming years. Thank you. Yes, sir. Other questions? Um, Dr. Jones, since you did touch on this, I don't believe our committee members have that tomorrow's agenda before them, but we do have a speaker from uh, Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks mm -hmm. tomorrow uh, at 9 o'clock when we begin. So yes, uh, that, th this discussion will be continued. Um, I see our Lieutenant Governor has wandered into the room. Thank you for attending our meeting this afternoon, Governor Hosman. Uh, are there uh, other questions or uh, comments that we have for Dr. Jones, who has given us a lively and encouraging uh, report about rural tourism and agritourism? 
Thank you, Senator. If there are no further questions or comments, we will resume tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. I trust you will all be here for more exciting news about tourism in Mississippi. Thank you for attending. If you have not signed your voucher, Senate members, please do so.